All right, we're going to start the live stream and the HDR is rolling. Sarah, that's a good spot where you are. I'm just. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Concordia University's Forest Space. And thank you for joining us for today's workshop, Traditional Japanese Material Practices as a Model for Sustainability in Clothing Design. Now, to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube Live from Forest Space. And we are located here on unceded Indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. At Force Space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities, examining research questions, projects, and development across the university. We're running today's event, and if you're joining us still on Zoom, you know uh, as a live stream Zoom meeting. So we welcome questions and comments there in the chat, and we'll do the best to get those uh, into the to uh, our speakers. And for those of you here in the space, of course, if you'd like to participate, just let us know, and we'll get a microphone to you so that everyone at home can hear. With that, it's very much my pleasure to pass it to Sarah Turner, who's going to introduce Larissa. Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, I'm Sarah Turner, co-director of the Loyola St Sustainability Research Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Hope and Agency in Uncertain Times conference. Um, this is a Sustainability Across Disciplines conference organized by the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability. Um, and I would really like to thank a number of people who've been instrumental in making this conference happen, uh, particularly, first and foremost, Rebecca Titler, who has done an amazing job of organizing and coordinating um, as the coordinator for the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, and as coordinator for this conference and organizer, um, and as a prof here at Concordia. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for all your hard work. I'd really like to thank um, Doug Miller and all of the folks at Fourth Space who um, do so much magic behind the scenes to make this hybrid kind of event possible, and uh, they really are you know, a wonderful team and such an asset to Concordia. So thank you so much, Doug and everybody in fourth space. And um, thanks to Anthony DiLolo, I don't know where you are, but um, our student coordinator and organizer for the conference, it's, um, he's done a lot of work and we really appreciate your labor. And to all the other folks who've been part of organizing events and presentations, it's um, this week of, of uh, hope and agency related activities and events and presentations couldn't happen without all of you. So I'd like to now introduce Larissa Hannah Zemke. Um, Larissa has an undergraduate degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and has worked um, in consulting and entrepreneurial projects um, in fashion. And most recently, she has a master's degree from Concordia University supervised by P.K. Langshaw in the Department of Design and Computational Arts. Um, so this workshop on traditional Japanese material practices as a mode for sustainability in clothing design um, is, is, her, is her brainchild and I will hand it over to her now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. All right, I'm pleased to be here today um, to share my research with all of you. Um, it's been quite a, a journey. <laughs> um, and um, so I wanted to begin with just a um, short presentation um, to sort of put you up to date with my research and introduce you a little bit. Uh, then you'll be able to look at some of the samples and ask some questions. And then uh, we'll proceed, proceed with a little hands-on workshop on some circular um, design practices inspired by Japanese um, my research in Japan. Okay, perfect. So I will share my screen now. And put it in. All right, 
Um, so just a brief sort of intro, uh, for the past 15 years, I've been working uh, in the global fashion industry on entrepreneurial consulting and teaching projects. Um, my most recent projects are, uh, well, my master's thesis at Concordia, um, the Dessouche Biomaterial uh, project that I worked uh, with, who, which was a collaboration with an undergrad student in the design and computation arts um, program. I've also collaborated with the Harvard Innovation Lab, um, where I did a research study uh, with a team of entrepreneurs on um, MMCFs, which are man-made cellulosic fibers um, in the fashion industry. And I also worked with the Quebec fashion industry to produce a prototype garment that I will show you in a moment. Um, as mentioned before, I have a bachelor's uh, degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology, where I studied international trade and marketing, but also textile surface design. Um, and uh, yes, and I most recently have a master's of design degree um, at Concordia. So I'll introduce you to my field research in Japan, which I did over the span of one year um, in Japan uh, pre-pandemic. Oh. And just before I want to reiterate that I worked in the industry for different brands and companies in New York, in Paris, um, you know, in Montreal over the years. And then I was lucky enough also to work with um, people in Japan, uh, more on an artisanal and small scale level. And also previously, I had launched my own platform to support emerging designers, where I was really passionate about seeing how can we support um, emerging designers and help them sort of launch their collections by getting pre-orders. And so a little bit about my uh, research in Japan. So I, I decided to fulfill a childhood dream and travel to Japan, uh, take one year for that and sort of do my field research before attending Concordia. And um, I use sort of an eth ethnographic, a participatory observational uh, field study approach. So I was very involved with actually learning hands-on how, how fibers are made, how to do natural dyeing, observing, speaking to people, uh, sometimes even staying with them. Uh, for example, in Wakayama on the map here, I spent a week with this lady and learned more about shibori and indigo dyeing, which some samples are here as well. Um, I really wanted to learn as much as I could about sort of the sustainable textiles in Japan, um, both on the historical level, but really like how it is part of their life and the more in rural Japan, of course. Um, and also because they have a variety of plant fibers, also known as bast fibers, um, that sort of practices that evolved. And that's, you know, a nice case to discuss in terms of sustainability, because it's really looking at, okay, what do we have locally here, you know, in terms of plants, and how has that evolved their textile practices? Um, so they have you know, fibers, for example, from uh, banana fiber, they create bashofu, um, which is a, a textile there in Okinawa. So I was lucky to travel there as well and to do uh, workshops and learn more about that. Um, in Miyako, Miyakojima also, which is a further island at the tip of Okinawa, closer to Taiwan, uh, they also use reimi, local reimi, to create a fiber for their clothing and textiles. Um, what else? Yes, I, I spent most of my time in Kyoto, really, uh, learning about the plant dyeing there, uh, working on a little farm. And it was really beautiful to see kind of the connection between, you know, our food consumption and our clothing consumption, because uh, the plants uh, were grown on the same plot of land. And um, actually, I later found out that the daughter of the owner, she also um, has a restaurant. So sort of that plot of land was like, you know, supplying a little local restaurant and also supplying the natural dyeing studio, uh, ateliers and workshops and sort of keeping sort of traditions going and, and yeah. All right. Um, so here you see kind of that little plot of land on the right at the bottom and sort of, you know, the lunches I had and the indigos uh, leaves 
drying in the sun. And really that wall with all the yarns are, yeah, plant dyed yarns. They weren't all from the plot of land, but um, yeah. All right. So there was a beautiful weaving studio. And this is a sample here, a beautiful scarf that he created with some of the yarns and the indigo we grew over there. And the marigold that we also grew on the plot of land is the yellow. Um, so a little bit more about, okay, the context um, that inspired my research was really that the unsustainability of the garment uh, industry. And that has been a topic, you know, that's been sort of gaining traction over the years. Thankfully, it's becoming a, a topic now. And there are many conferences you can attend and, and really, um, you know, learn more about how companies are trying to tackle that. Um, because there's really, you know, and, and because there's so much overconsumption, right? And, and mass production. So they kind of go hand in hand. And, um, you know, the first step of my study was really, okay, looking at what is, how do we even define sustainability? And um, there are different angles to take to really uh, define that. Um, you know, a number of studies, companies are now even like creating their own sustainability guides with sort of, principles by which they try to, you know, produce clothing or, or the articles, right? Um, then we have also the environmental and health impacts of clothing production and consumption. So really looking a bit more at, um, you know, how is that impacting the environment, but also our health, for example, chemical dyes, 70% of water waterways in China are polluted because of toxic dyes through the industry. So it just gives you an idea of how, you know, how, how bad it's gotten. Um, and then you can also imagine that, you know, there are some studies that talk about the chemicals in our clothing and how we could absorb them. Um, and obviously that would impact our health, right? Because we can breathe them, we can ingest them. It's, it's minor. There are not that many studies on it, um, but there's some research going on um, exploring that as well. And it was interesting enough to uh, learn in Japan that actually back then they were also using dyes and clothing as for healing. So if a samurai was injured, then they would actually use the dyed fabric and put it on the wound. Or for example, for a baby, when you, when they're born, you wrap them in fabric and then they would also dye, um, the fabric with a certain, um, uh, you know, plant uh, for healing purposes. And I know also in India, I think it's the Jain, I may be wrong, but they're sort of a group of people that don't believe in um, wearing clothing that is not um, sewn at all. So it's literally just the cloth. And sometimes they also would dye their cloth in turmeric and then kind of suck on it as a healing because turmeric is amazing. It's uh, it's got amazing properties, right? So just kind of thinking about those traditional ways we used to connect with our clothing, um, you know, and it would actually benefit our health versus now where we wear clothing with so many dyes. Every you know, now there's so many different news about coatings being toxic. Or, you know, in, in California, there was a law passed recently against sort of um, the coatings that are uh, waterproof, you know, that are toxic, right? So, so that kind of context and really thinking about, okay, what can we take, you know, what sustainability approaches can we adopt for local, on a local scale? Um, so challenges of unsustainability in the garment industry include, you know, like I said, the non-biodegradable waste, toxic dyes, coatings, right, overconsumption. And, um, you know, that led me to like a deeper investigation of what are the origins of unsustainability? And definitely the writings of uh, Professor Kate Fletcher from uh, UAL in London were very inspirational. And she sort of talks about also the mantra of less is more. How can we go towards that? And so the objectives and scopes of my research were to uncover uh, sustainable approaches for designers and consumers, but really on a local level. So applying Japanese traditional frameworks and sustainable design through material and performative experiments. 
um, to uncover more sustainable approaches. So in the end, I created a hunt and jacket, well, I'll show you, which I'll show you in a moment, using uh, biodegradable materials and Japanese techniques. And I really wanted to work with different stakeholders at Concordia. And so, for example, I collaborated with the People's Potato Kitchen to collect onion peels as a, as a food waste to use as a dye source. So you see some peels here. Uh, every week I would go up to them and collect a massive bag of onion peels uh, that were my dye source. And I decided to use that because I thought we should really think about what is available locally. Why should I now go and, you know, import indigo dye from Japan, right? I wanted to work with what's available here. And I think that is also key for circularity. And onions are one of the most... Um, locally produced and locally consumed vegetables in the world as well. And it's of course a, bagel, a basic, right, in every kitchen. Um, all right, so. So some frameworks that inspired my research are also design with care, localism, which also is, comes from Kate Fletcher, uh, slow fashion, the life cycle of a garment, which is sort of an industry standard that's used to assess the impact of the overall life of a garment, which includes the disposal phase. Okay. Um, it goes all the way from raw material extraction through fabric creation, through garment creation, consumption, all the way to disposal. So here's that life cycle. And I was looking at, okay, what part of my process sort of fits at the beginning of life cycle of a garment and what is the end of life cycle, the other half where it's sort of consumed and disposed. And for the beginning of life cycle of a garment, I created a new jacket, okay? So I produced it here locally with partners, including the People's Potato, a fashion designer, um, some an insulation producer, dancers at Concordia for the performative aspect. And um, yeah. And for the end of life cycle, it was more about upcycling garments. So taking anything we already have or that's secondhand, and how can we give it a new life? How can we prolong the life? How can we create a connection with a garment, a new one? You know, whether it's a gift for someone or for ourselves. So um, the research creation process involved so looking at the materials okay i was thinking i want to use insulation um, it can be produced locally so i don't know if you've heard of milkweed um, but it grows in quebec the monarch butterflies feed on it and so i was i went to visit the factory near pomo and um, use that insulation to create the garment and i was thinking about that thing about regenerative systems so supporting, you know, monarch, monarch butterflies, uh, which are endangered, biodegradability, thinking about minimal use of resources as well. I was thinking also about the function of the garment, you know, um, and, and so I also chose natural fibers because maybe I'm an advocate for natural fibers. I'm not saying they are the most sustainable because, for example, cotton is very resource intensive in terms of water and chemicals, yeah. Um, but I wanted it to have that breathability um, versus let's say if you use um, synthetics, they don't breathe as well. So I want to use insulation, but have the garment breathe as well and give it sort of a luxurious quality. And yes, I chose also silk and you know, it doesn't grow here, but maybe part of that was, you know, inspired by Japan because a lot of the lining in the kimonos is silk, you know, and, and details. And it great, gave it sort of a beauty to the garment. Um, yeah. All right. Here is, yeah, we did a beautiful photo shoot as well. Uh, Rafaela is here and she was in the photo on the side, the beautiful photo we did. We did a gorgeous photo shoot. Um, and then thinking about who has worked on it. So I also uh, put all the names of the people who collaborated and really tried to think about the story of the garment. How can we communicate 
the story because a lot of things are about storytelling like back in the day people used to have connections with you know the person they went to buy their food at they understood where things were growing or you know all the attributes that came you know that put the food on your table but now we are unfortunately so far removed with you know mass production so it's kind of like how can we retell those stories and think about how are we investing our ma our time our money you know uh, for purchasing garments and food and everything our health so this is the exhibition that was here at four space um in 2022 already wow okay <laughs> Um, yeah, so we had a gorgeous exhibition here. And just to sum up, um, the research creation results were really looking at, okay, what was the beginning of life cycle? How can we lower the environment until impact of a garment? Applying those Japanese natural dyeing techniques and zero waste pattern making because I use the pattern of a kimono as the basis of the garment we created. Um, locally sourcing, you know, materials and dye stuff. Uh, collaborating with local partners, applying sort of these Japanese frameworks, um, and really building awareness of sort of the connection between wearers and garments. And also using a performative and conceptual perspective um, to kind of think about those interactions between garment and wear. Okay. And yep, just to sum up, I'm really happy to be here and share my research with you. I'm open to other speaking opportunities, collaborations, or, um, you know, hosting workshops, if that's of interest, mentoring, here's my info. So thanks so much for listening. And now I'll invite you to take a look at the garment as well. So I will show you the final garment here. So it's all um, dyed with onion peels. Uh, so it's cotton on the outside and silk on the inside. I chose to sort of tell a bit more about the story of the garment on the outside here as well, of the hood. The hood um, does not come with this garment tradition. So it's a based on a traditional garment, which is a coat worn in Japan, more at home or to run errands um, and it's typically made of cotton. I actually was given a gift while I was in Japan and it was made out of synthetic, synthetic fabric and synthetic insulation. And I wore it so much, but I didn't breathe well. So I think maybe that would also influence my design choices to create this garment and natural fibers. Yeah, Is sure. Cotton, uh, wax? No. I thought about waxing too because I was like, oh, maybe we I could use this outside, you know, and maybe it could become a coat. But then I thought, no, to me, it should just be something maybe you can even wear at home. It will be cozy. And yeah, it's not water resistant. With the hood, it seems yes. Like everywhere. Yes. So I was kind of inspired by sportswear as well. I wanted something um, sort of every day. And yeah. All right. Sure. Thanks. Insulation is a milkweed, um, so it's it's partially milkweed. Twenty five percent milkweed, and yeah, I gotta ch double check the numbers. But kapok, it's a partially also kapok, a big part of it. Kapok, it's um, plants that grows in Indonesia. It's also used as insulation, and actually both of those have been used in life vests as well uh, for floating yeah um milkweed a traditional insulation because I, I mean i know that it produces the, the silk and things like that but yeah yeah, yeah. Does it have it's a good question and i do not think so because it's a very um um it's almost like a feather it's very volatile it will just this is, you know, disintegrate and float away. And that's why you need the kapok. So even the production part kind of calm. And um, the founder worked like for over 10 years to perfect this. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately it's mixed with kapok, which is not local, but it's biodegradable. And so has a cornstarch like PLA to kind of fix it together. If you don't mind, I'll just gonna 
Oh yeah. I'm just gonna pass the microphone Okay. so that people can Yeah, hear yeah. any Sure. talks that way. I'll, Thanks. I'll... Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Other questions? Or I'm also inviting you to take a look at the samples if you want to ask me questions. Um, here is more the indigo um, samples we I, I created in Japan. Um, this is more dyed. It's called Bengara dyeing, and it's with an earth. And you have to like really like it, it takes a lot of effort. <laughs> you gotta really rub that earth into there to create those. Uh, this is dowry, um, which was a technique that uh, was created in, founded in the 60s, I believe. And it's more um, uh, got a meditative aspect to it because you're kind of using whatever scraps you can find to weave into it. You're not supposed to think too much. So it felt very therapeutic and calming and awesome, honestly. Um, then... A more shibori. Marisa, yeah. How, what's the name? This one? Yeah. Saori. Saori, it's S A O R I. Yeah. Uh, I believe there's also a research paper on that you can find online, I think, pretty easily. Um, I think it was an American student, master student. Um, this was dyed, I think, with persimmon, sun dried. Um, more like a basket weave. Um, yes. Is it possible to get any really bright colors with um, natural dyes? Okay, very good question. So you can use mordants to help you. Okay, so for example, here, the mordant was, um, so this was also marigold, but we used a mordant. So you can get more of this dull color, which is the iron mordant. So if you use iron, which you could create your own iron water with rusty nails, okay, that you then you can get like duller colors. And if you want to get brightness, you use alum. You can buy, buy this also in like bulk barn or anywhere, and that will um, give it more brightness. So that's what was used in the jacket to create the inside the silk color, mm -hmm. the bright yellow. Mm -hmm. Because it's the same dye. Did you, this is so weird. Uh, did you work with anyone to do uh, any like traditional repair techniques um, to like help the life okay. cycle of? Yes. Okay, good question. So actually with another fellow Concordia student, she was in the fibers department. She's no longer here. As all, otherwise I would have had her <laughs> uh, come for that workshop as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some workshop um, at Force Space to do mending. So more like on darning. Um, technique um, where we showed people how to, yes, exactly, do some darning. There are different ways to do it. I also have another example. So you could kind of, um, you know, use different threads. You could use finer, but here it's more a visual aspect, you know, whatever you kind of want to bring it more of an embellishment, bold look, or you could also use finer yarns. And I, I put it in one of my, I like this cardigan a lot. <laughs> Well, it's cashmere, so it's kind of soft. Um, but you can also, you know, use a contrasting color. It's kind of a fine. Um, I'll have it here, sort of inner, you know, to mend uh, the holes in knits. So that's an option for today as well. If you're interested in that, we can look at that together. Um, yes. There's a book about that at the Grand Bibliothèque. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting us know. So if anyone's further interested in that, maybe. Um, what's your name? Allison. Allison. Okay, great. Thank you, Allison. Perfect. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in your works, you're talking a lot about the life cycle of garments and what are those like techniques and all this philosophy of clothing? How would you bring it to like topics, for example, like secondhand clothing and like mm -hmm. reuse clothing, especially like with the trend of thrift stores, mm -hmm. when we oppose it to like fast fashion that is like famous for degrading very fast? How yeah. do you like, how do you include those philosophies in this longer cycle yeah. of clothing? Thanks so much. And your name is? 
uh, Akira. Akira. Okay, yeah, I'd appreciate everyone kind of introduces themselves. But that would be really nice. Um, so, right, in the context of thrift stores and fast fashion, so I'm sure you've seen it as well, but thrift stores over the years have become more also, a, I, I would say, they've, they're good. Definitely we need them. It's a good thing because it will keep clothes longer in the cycle. But in another way, it's also encouraging people to just like consume more and feel that they can just sort of, they know they have another place they can just not throw, but, you know, <laughs> bring their clothes. So it also encourages, it's, it's not fully a solution, but it can definitely help bring, you know, keep clothes from landing in the landfill faster, of course. So the cycle will be longer. Um, I would also say if we look at it back like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, thrift stores had more like actually vintage things that were like constructed better of better materials. Now you really got to dig to find things that are, you know, are actually made better with fabrics. Mm -hmm. okay. Is the quality of the of what we find in thrift stores today like that because we aren't producing as much uh, good wool fabric or is it the quality sorry can you just the quality of what we're finding like you said yeah so much is being produced that's plastic and not let's say the best quality like why is that in three okay it's a good question um i think you can still find wool for sure um but the rate of just production has increased so much and they're trying to keep costs low and so they're producing lower quality because they know anyway people will throw it soon it doesn't need to it's not it doesn't need to be built to last anymore right um but for example in japan there were a lot of thrift stores also and they resell military garments and when you look at those at least like they're not all let's say natural fibers, but they, sometimes they had cotton for sure. And just the way it's built, it's like very sturdy, right? And I think we used to make fabrics much more like that. But now, because of the rate of consumption, it's fine. We can build things that are weaker in construction because we're pumping out so much clothes, you know? It's unfortunate. And we've gotten used to not keeping things anymore anyway, and let alone repairing, right? So repairing takes effort, it's time figuring out how to repair it, right? But coming back to your point, Akira, I think that these techniques of like either repairing or naturally dying or changing your garment can give it a new life because it's true. Sometimes we look at a wardrobe and we say, my gosh, I'm bored of my wardrobe. I don't, you know, I've been wearing this for a while. I want something fresh in me, right? We all want that. So how can you creatively do that instead of being like oh i'm going to toss this away right you can kind of think of also maybe you had a t-shirt or some item you had when you were a kid for such a long time it has meaning to you right i think you can recreate that through engaging with your garment and giving it a new life and you will see the more you you know we think our investment is just to drop money but when you invest and you put time into it you're re-engaging and you're creating a new connection with your garments. And I'm guarantee you, I don't know how long, how much longer you'll keep it, but you'll definitely keep it longer because you invested your time in it, you know? It's kind of like when your grandmother, she knitted you socks, right? Or it's something dear, she made it for you, you know? Keep that Oh, okay. Just run and ask you to use the hand filter. Sure. Okay. Just okay. for this yeah. online, he can't hear you. Oh, got it. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. That's on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. I'm Pramila, and I have a question. First of all, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. And I guess we all like you have worked for so many years in industry and then you lived one year in Japan. And we still have these live 
uh, cultures like in South Asia, in India, mm -hmm. in Nepal, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. in Japan, where people yeah. are still using these methods, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you come across any uh, tools or initiatives which you are really hopeful that they are really making impact? Because what we are talking, we all are concerned and we are talking these things like more these days, like on this table or mending workshops or anywhere, right? So do you really think are there people with these kind of a constant conversation, conferences, research, mm -hmm. There is a hope, or there are really good initiatives which are making impact, or there are tools which people can really, because it's another, as you said, like we all want to dress up and we want to look good, right? So one is you have your own style. Like I, I, I just came and I was really appreciating her, uh, their earrings and everything, whatever they have done. It's like beautifully. It's an example what you were just saying, right? Mm -hmm. But are there on on like a bigger industry level or uh, there are initiatives or there are like tools which you think in coming future will make some difference because they started now or last few years they've been doing and they're really coming up with something which is meaningful and it changing the industry met, like way of doing things yeah th it's a long question but I'm really like in the question you know <laughs> it's like sustainability and all of these issues are um, quite complex you know and uh, there are different initiatives within, within companies you know to sort of move towards that and for example one is like let's say Patagonia has always been on the forefront of um, innovation with you know towards more sustainable practices but that's because that's like been their sort of baseline when they first started it's not something they adopted that's just been there from day one um, and so, for example, they have their Warnware program where they'll repair things or they'll resell things. They'll ask people to send it back, repair it and resell. So those are, of course, great because they're sort of keeping things in the loop. They're now also, for example, um, uh, built a nylon shell jacket from uh, fi recycled fishing nets. So they're trying to use innovation to reuse, for example, fishing nets waste. Um I have that jacket. I was happy to get it, <laughs> but it was chance. I'm, I wasn't looking for it, but it found me. I found it. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but I would say so there are those kind of initiatives. But of course, like at the end of the day, comp biggest challenge is that companies are still, you know, cost driven. And so there's that pressure from investors to keep the business running. Um, but yes, there are beautiful initiatives. For example, um, I was at two, con three conferences last year. Um, the New York one was a sustainability innovation forum. And the other one in Boston was hosted, uh, was the global fashion summit and the sustainable apparel coalition. And, you know, all these actors from the companies came together to talk about these challenges. Um, uh, Sorry, I just the train of thought went somewhere, but no, no, no. Oh, yes. And there's, for example, um, a professor at MIT who's launched a big research project on footwear specifically to trace the impact of footwear and different solutions. The study hasn't come out yet, but, you know, they're they're building sort of um, uh, a project. So it's like academic working with academia and industry. So New Balance is part of that, for example. So there are sort of in initiatives to see, um, you know, how can we wor work towards better ways? But of course, there are big challenges uh, still to face, but there's movement, you know. Yeah, I hope that answers your question <laughs> partially. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So specifically, there's a store called Mini Souris. It sells baby clothing. Okay. And they have a program where they give you money for baby clothes that are no longer be okay. you can sell them <laughs> um because it's my new piece of clothing I, like, and they produce clothing as well yeah they produce clothes they think, oh, we'll take it back I just, me, 
what was greenwashing before, saying you'll do something good. But how do we know that they're doing something good? So that's also a big topic, right? Thank you for asking that question. Um, transparency, right? And there's a call for more of that because there's been a lot of greenwashing and, you know, now there's still pressure to, you know, pump out like sustainability, you know, numbers that say that you're more sustainable, right? So it's still a blurry line. I think companies are realizing that it's essential for the future, um, and they need to tackle these problems. And, you know, with now EU laws are sort of, you know, trailblazing or really moving, pushing the movement forward, um, that slowly that's going to happen. But I understand your concern. And I mean, I'm hoping that there will be more measures that are a bit more like guidelines for companies to really, you know, to um, to be able to back sort of, you know, their statements and their requests. I mean, there are auditing firms, you know, now there are companies that do, um, you know, certification uh, like Blue Sign and different um, organizations. Um, the Higgs Index has also become sort of an index which by which companies can sort of measure their impact throughout the value chain. So there's, you know, slow movement. Um, but I can totally understand your concern and it's, it's interesting, um, you know, that these companies would say that and I wonder how they're actually managing that. So, um, that yes, that, yeah. go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say, we'll take we maybe one more. We got to wrap up because I wanted to show you a little bit the techniques. I mean, we won't actually be natural dying today, but I want to show you a little bit and then maybe you can take home. And if you have questions, you can email me or you want some more info of how to do the process, I could definitely email it to you, okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm just eagerly anticipating the next part. Okay, perfect, yes, because we're at 2.12. Oh, uh, and I wanted just to say, I know Noemi is a friend from Japan and she's here. Um, I don't know if she's still here because of time difference. And she was saying that she missed the jacket. So I want to show her quickly, if you don't mind. <laughs> really quick, because she didn't get to attend my um, my exhibit. I don't know if she sees it here, but maybe. Oh, the camera's there. Uh, it's 3 a.m. in Japan, yeah. so she I don't know if she's still on, but I'm really happy that she was able to join for a little. Thank you, Noemi. I hope you're seeing this. Um, if not, we'll have to catch up your time. All right. Perfect. So. Um, so I, I wanted to just get an idea, a sense of um, what's the interest here? Um, Who's, if you could raise your hand, who's interested in learning more about the natural dyeing process? And who came here more for the mending? How many? Wait, I'm trying to get a count. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, and maybe the other ones were more natural dyeing, maybe? Huh? About the same, I think. Okay, so... Um, just to show you like the natural dyeing, we could say are more these areas. And really what I focused on for my research was these. I also tried a bit of avocado dyeing, but realized that avocados are not really supporting the environment because they're causing deforestation and they're not local. So I didn't choose them as a dye source, although they've become very popular um, most recently. So um, yeah, so maybe we'll just start briefly with the... Um, natural dyeing um, techniques. So uh, for example, basically you have these um, different motifs you can create here, right? And there are different techniques, but one easy way is for example, to use like marbles, okay? And you can wrap them in your fabric and you can put an elastic and you will create the resist. You just really bind it tightly, right? You could do that with thread as well. For example, in the pandemic, and I believe as well that sustainability is also about reusing materials through your in your process, right? So how can you creatively use uh, materials you might be throwing away? So for example, um, I did also did a mask project um, 
sort of an origami mass project during um, my thesis, uh, my master's here. And I was reusing the elastics from the masks, the throw throwaway masks, instead of buying more elastic bands. So how can I reuse those things that we throw away, right? And another problem was, for example, that um, they say animals get caught within those elastic from the masks. So I tore them off and, you know, reuse them. At least they're not like fixed to the mask anymore, right? Um, so yeah, you create a knot and you can use it as an elastic. Um, you could also use, oh, here, <laughs> I had bike tube. It's also rubber. Huh? You cut that in little strips and you use it as an elastic. So I did that as well for some resist um, uh, projects. Then of course, so I went to Sucker. So I was also collaborating with Sucker. Uh, they're the center of creative reuse at Concordia. If you don't know them, you should go check it out. You might get lucky and find something you need. Um, but for example, I got nylon thread from them. And that's what I mainly use to create the resist patterns that I did on my my work. I also even little gross maybe, but <laughs> I started collecting my dental floss. <laughs> I washed and I used that as well to stitch it. I tried it worked because it's also waxed. And I was reading in my research that you can work use waxed uh, threads because it's a resist to water, right? So you could also do that. I mean, I did disinfect it, you know, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, so just to, you know, give you some, oh, I still have some leftover floss. <laughs> but creative ways to reuse, you know, instead of buying and sometimes we'll throw them away, right? Those things. Um, so what can I tell you for the onion peels? Well, you collect as much as you can, right? From your onion peels when you're cooking. I hope you eat onions. They're great and healthy for you. Raw also has vitamin C, by the way. Who knew? Um, but yeah, you could collect the, the onion peels. And basically what you do is you need tools. Definitely make sure that if you're doing this at home, you have a ventilation and you use tools that you dedicate to this dyeing. Okay. I don't know the reason, but just they typically advise that you don't use your, you know, the, the pot you cook your food in, right? So you have a designated pot. Enamel can be better um, because metals, maybe they can rust or that it would change the dye color, right? Um, and literally what you take is you take water, like, and you boil, uh, you bring to boil all of your, your onion peels and then you let it simmer 45 minutes, half an hour. You see, you ex extract your peels and you have sort of, your right now, um, for the garments you have or the fabric, well, you want a light colored fabric you know, ideally white or something like that. If you have a t-shirt, if you've worn it before, you have to understand that, you know, you sweat and you had different, you know, um, sort of maybe stains on there that you don't see anymore now, but you've worn it, right? So those traces will come up if you're dying it, you know? So you could try to like um, tr pre-treat it either with vinegar, salt, Salt works. Eh. Soy, soy milk can work pretty well as well. So there are different ways to do that. If you want more information, you can email me. Um, so you would soak your fabric before you you dye it in the pot. And basically you would be then keeping, putting the, the fabric in that dye solution. Also half an hour. So it's on very low heat and it will kind of like be cooking your clothing. Now I've also experimented with wool. It's very sweet to do, but it will shrink your wool <laughs> by quite a bit. So wool doesn't work as well, but you could do silk, cotton, linen, any of those fabrics. Um, so that's a bit about my process. Now you of course want to also wash it after and try to make sure you're washing it in cold water to really get all the dye out, it take some time. Uh, maybe also with a natural soap, you can just kind of wash it a little. Um, you've got to note as well that this is a natural dye and you know it's not fully like light fast, so it can change. So there's kind of also, you know, the perspective of realizing that with these natural processes, 
the colors may change a little, right? And we're so used to having our colors fixed, staying the same. And if they don't, we're like, why did that happen, right? <laughs> so yes, more volatile. Or if you get a stain, your stain may definitely not get off, right? Come off because it's like reacting with, you know, the dye that you used. Um, are there any other questions about that? You can also you collect sumac, for example. I did a project also tried with sumac. It grows um, even on Le Mont Royal. Uh, it's sort of a native local plant. Oh, I brought an example here. It's kind of that stuff. Yeah, right? Um, so that? Sumac. sumac okay so it can give more of a mauvey kind of gray color depending also if you use let's say an iron to fix it more it will become more dull right i haven't tried it with alum so it might give it more brightness questions um, yeah i've used sumac and it will at first be beautiful like kind of pinkish um, color reddish brownish and then it turned brown or like a okay. with alum sorry yes oh a bit more reddish yeah so it, it will like change color even oh. after you touch it yeah so there's that um okay and then for the mending and darning well um i i know we only have a few minutes left now but if you have questions i can show you would you like to see how that works yeah yes <laughs> i would like to know how you start with a hole yeah you mean how to bend the yeah, hole right yeah. okay good question sure <laughs> so basically it's kind of similar to weaving really um you're you're kind of going up and over okay and you're also creating like a woven you and once you have let's say your warp i don't know if you've woven before but you have a strip going on one way then you're gonna under and you know like we used to do when we did paper when we were kids right um you don't need to do knots but you can when you start you know if you want a little knot uh, but it won't come off like you're going to be looping it so much like a woven you don't even need to um yeah I've done it as well. Yeah. Mend it a hole. You just have to oh. you have you have to make sure that if it's a big hole, you make space for your weave that it you're giving it the same space um like your length of string, uh -huh. right? To make that weave fits that hole. Because if you pull it tight, you're actually yes. pulling your fabric together and that's what you have to uh, not do if you want it to be like a blind weave sort of good point yes thank you so much yes yeah, so you don't want to pull it super tight uh because then you're also going to gather everything and it's going to create a gather right you want it to kind of flat um so don't be afraid to kind of have open spaces at the beginning you fill it in you know as you do your sleeve um other questions Unfortunately, yeah, we don't have that much time. It would have been like two hours maybe to do everything. But, yeah. Do you have any tips for uh, for um, thick fabrics that tend to break the needle in your uh, sewing machine? How to repair that? Wow. Well, definitely the needle you're using is important, right? So you need to look at the fabric, right? And then tips, what needle are you placing into the sewing machine, right? Also, you might need a special one, heavy duty one. You might even need a heavy duty machine at that point, right? Because there are some. Like I've sewn le thin leather, like lambskin, on a normal regular machine with a different needle. It worked, but I was like, oh, poor machine, it's working hard, <laughs> you know? Um, or industrial machines, you know, are also good for that. Um, but I think definitely the key is your needle, huh? what needle you're using. And then also, uh, what's the ideal thread, right? Like leather, it's usually nylon, it's very strong, right? So those are, I think, tips for you. Um, yeah, 
to know what needle, you know, depending on the fabric. Is that is that helpful? Um, well, I don't have access to an industrial machine, but I'll try it with a different needle. You can yes. And they also recently started another initiative where they repair if you have uh, oh, yeah. machines. They repair machines yeah. at Sucker. And, and That's very cool. And also they collect a lot of electronics from the mm -hmm. uh, campus, mm -hmm. repair, and give it. That's awesome. Wow. So they have some treasures, maybe. Yeah, you got to check there. Oh, <laughs> All right. Amazing. That sounds like a great resource. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah. Anybody have other questions? I was thinking maybe we could take a picture or I don't know if there's a possibility on my phone. To... I'd love that. Photos. Be awesome. Thanks, Doug. Okay, yeah, this has been really a pleasure. Please do contact me if you have other questions or want to host something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, feel free to take a look around. Thanks so much, Doug. All right. Um, Just a note to anyone on Zoom, if you have any questions, you could pop them in the chat and we could read them out. I'm not sure if there are any there, but uh, we're watching. Oh, yeah, Noemi was just giving a comment. I just see now she had to go. I mean, oh, she's not in Japan anymore. Sorry, I. she moved to Switzerland. So that's a little better in terms of time difference. Um, but um. She was also really interested in textiles. She was a PhD student there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's also Sashiko. I don't know if you've heard of it. Unfortunately, I didn't bring, I have some pants that are not like natural dyed with indigo uh, from my mentor there. And there was also Sashiko stitching that you can do. It's a beautiful technique. You can also patch up and, you know, garments. And they also have these antique um, garments um, using it's called boro and where they really like have layers and layers of patched garments and I think that came out from what I remember also out of scarcity so I think because now everything's so accessible garments people don't know what to do with them they're thrown in bins you know we have so much of them but back then in Japan for example cotton was very scarce um, so they were like patching them up all, you know, and so you have these gorgeous garments that are just layered, beautiful patches and they, you know, stitch together through the sashiko technique, um, you know, that sort of, yeah, I mean, visually, they definitely embody like history and reuse and sort of those principles of sustainability, I think, yeah. All right. Anyone else, other questions or we've got to end here. I know uh, the event's got to keep going. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad I could share with all of you and be back at Force Space. Thank you so much to everyone and the team, our Force Space team as well. And Rebecca, of course, for organizing this awesome um, week. So yeah, don't hesitate to check out all the other lovely events that will be happening at the space this week. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Larissa, for that wonderful presentation and for bringing in all these textiles for everyone to have a look at. That was really interesting. And thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, it was my and pleasure. Thanks to Doug and the Fourth Space for hosting. And I'm going to pass, and thanks to Rebecca, and I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca now to talk about some of the upcoming events. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Oh, if I still there. Okay. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you, Larissa. Always so interesting. Oh, a picture together. <laughs> Always really yeah. gets me to, makes yeah. me want to get my sewing machine out. And, Aww. and uh, I love yeah. that. Yeah. But I'm happy yeah. to host if there's other possibilities to share in my work. Great. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to let people know that uh, this is part of an ongoing. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, lots of excitement here in the space. Um, this is part of a week-long conference. We have Thursday off except for an evening celebration. Uh, you can check out the conference website, which has all of our activities. We'll be here in the four space um, this afternoon. Uh, continuing and then tomorrow and Wednesday. On Friday, we will be at Loyola in person only, but until then we're at Force Space online and in person. Um, coming up next at 3.30, we have our read readings panel, our book panel, readings for hope and agency. Um, we have five panelists coming to talk about uh, books that we recommend to our students, that we recommend to each other, that we use ourselves um, to find hope and inspire us. Back in hour or so. <laughs> um, and then tomorrow, um, you can switch the slide, Tony. <laughs> if you take a look at the conference website, you'll see all the wonderful we have coming up tomorrow uh, and Wednesday uh, as well. Wednesday is a very full day, as you can see, um, both at Force Space again in person and online. Um, and then on Friday, one more switch. We will be only in person. Please do come out and join us at Loyola, the pretty campus. Um, there will be lunch uh, for conference registrants. It's uh, where the party is, at Loyola. <laughs> um, we look forward to seeing you in person or online. One more. <laughs> um, I do have to thank all of the people who contributed uh, financially. Thank you, Sarah, for contributing those who have commuted contribute there for thanking those who have contributed all their energy. Um, this conference is an annual event uh, brought to you by the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability and the Loyola Sustainability Research Center in collaboration with For Space without would not be doing all of the wonderful things that we're doing over the next three days. Um, we have funding from the Office of Research here at Concordia, as well as from the uh, School of Public Affairs, the Science College, uh, First People Study, the Geography, the Department. On, do do. I lost you. Okay, the Department of Biology, Geography, Political Science, and I can't see the me because my microphone goes out. Uh, oh, I don't want to forget communication study. Um, so thank you to all those who supported us uh, with with funding for these. When? Okay, um, so do come back. If you got here, you've probably been to the website, but if you haven't, the QR code is right here. Um, please join us the rest of the week. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. For those of you on Zoom, feel free to stick around. We're gonna close up the live stream on YouTube and just know that that's, this workshop is available there immediately on our channel, see you fourth space. Uh, okay, we're gonna work on our mic problems. Thank you for enduring that and uh, stick around. See you soon, bye.